Once upon a time, a caravan of traders would brave dust storms and bandits and travel through a cruel landscape, all the way from China and India to Samarkand. They carried with them porcelain, lacquerware, spices, gems, furs, incense, ivory, and of course, silk. That mysterious cloth from China worth its weight in gold. But they also brought with them extremely influential commodities, things which they could not carry in their camel bags. Music, culture, and the great religions of the day, Buddhism, and later Islam. While traders brought with them the secrets of printing, paper making, tantric sex, and wine making, they also exchanged stories and ballads all along this route. This is the story of the Silk Road, and this is the story of the cities and people along that route. The story of Uzbekistan. Uzbekistan once again saw new light in September 1991, when it broke its umbilical cord with the Soviet Union, ushering in a new era of hopes, dreams, and ambitions. Today is on the verge of writing history. Its people, calm and easygoing, are nevertheless committed to achieve the dreams of a nation. For centuries, Uzbekistan has been at a geographic and cultural crossroads, where some influences were absorbed and others rebuffed. The landscape is a collage of the ancient and the modern. Colors and cultures, the bright sun and flashing gold teeth. Being on the ancient Silk Route, Uzbekistan shares a common legacy with several countries in this part of the world. However, it continues to build on the relationships conceived on common grounds with countries like India too. In fact, it would be wrong to base India's relationship with Uzbekistan merely on the grounds that Baba, the founder of the Mughal dynasty in India, was born in Uzbekistan. The traces of common ground between India and Uzbek civilization can surprise many. Almost all historical events, either man-made or natural, in any one country had direct repercussions in the other. History shares amazingly similar tales in both the books. Once the great Indian king Ashoka adopted Buddhism, he took it upon himself to spread the message of peace to all parts, including Central Asia. In 329 BC, history chronicles Alexander's conquest of Samarkand, and three years later, the great invader's army was knocking on the doors of India's borders. The rise of Islam was also almost simultaneous. The Arabs conquered Sindh in India and Samarkand in Uzbekistan almost in the same year, around 711 A.D. The Arabs conquered almost the whole of Central Asia, and Uzbekistan too became a part of the Islamic Caliphate. In India, however, the Arab conquest was soon reversed. The introduction of Islam came much later, almost 200 years. When the recently converted Muslim Turks came, they had an impact on the religious, political, and cultural order of India. Caravani, 
Вот в городах Бухара, Самарканд, Хива, Термес, Шаш, они встречались караваны с севера, с юга, с запада, с востока. Значит, караваны из Индии, караваны из Китая, караваны из арабских стран. Поэтому вот эта Центральная Азия привлекает внимание ученых из Запада и стран Ближнего Востока, стран Севера, Китая, стран Индии, Южной Азии. Потому что здесь встречаются различные культуры. What happened in medieval times around the 8th to the 14th century changed the course of history of both these countries. The people of India and Uzbekistan came in close contact with one another, albeit with a bit of force. As a direct result, people and knowledge and ideas moved from India to Central Asia and vice versa. The result was a phenomenal outburst of intellectual awakening and cultural effervescence in Uzbekistan. For instance, Abu Jaffa Muhammad, Ibn Musa, al khwarezmi regarded as the father of algebra derived from the Arabic word al-Jabra, was the first to use the Indian system of numerals and the Indian invented zero. His astronomical charts, known as Zij, were also based on Indian calculations. There was also Abu Ali ibn Sina, an encyclopedist who excelled in geometry, physics, astronomy and musicology. He wrote 200 books, 45 of which were on medicine. Ibn Sina made extensive use of Indian works of Charak and Surusta to compose the Encyclopedia of Yunani Medicine, al Kanun. But perhaps the greatest genius of them all was Abu Rehan Muhammad ibn Ahmed al-Baruni, or just al-Baruni. A versatile genius, excelling in all physical sciences, mathematics, astronomy, mineralogy, etc. He successfully attempted to measure the circumference of the earth and calculated the number of days in a year. He carried out these experiments in India. The results were extremely close to the findings of modern science. Out of 150 books that Al-Biruni wrote, 20 are on India. He travelled extensively in India for 17 years, studied Sanskrit at Varanasi. Being an orthodox Muslim scholar, he was the first Arab Muslim to point out that despite all the polytheism and idol worship, at a higher level, Hindus believed in one God. In his academic arguments, he would often quote from Lord Krishna, an orthodox Muslim quoting Lord Krishna, something quite unthinkable in those times. Прошло тысячи лет, как говорится, посещают наши, как говорится, ученые и государственные деятели в Индию и государственные деятели ученые в Индии в Среднюю Азию, особенно в Ташкент, в Узбекистан. Вот, например, можно, можно привести, да, это самое. Вот, например, я могу привести, были такие государства, выдающиеся государственные деятели Индии, премьер-министры Джавахалал Неру, Лал Бахадур Шастри, Индира Ганди и президенты Раджиндра Прасад, Гири, Закир Хусейн и другие. The exchange of intellect and people's ideas carried on through the centuries. Even in the 20th century, India and Uzbekistan, which was then a part of the former Soviet Union, continued to greet the geniuses of their times. Hindustan and Uzbekistan are very important. We have a lot of friends and friends. और हिंदुस्तान और उज़्बेकिस्तान के बीच एक दूसरे की तरफ एक खास कस्म की खिंचाव है तो इसीलिए और खास तौर पर जब ने जब हमने यूनिवर्सिटी में हिंदी सीखने का फैसला किया तो उस वक्त हिंदुस्तान अपने आप को हमें खुल रहा था हिंदुस्तान के लीडर पंडित जवाहरलाल नेहरू आए फिर हिंदुस्तान की फिल्में आ गए और हिंदुस्तान से मिले हुए बहुत से यहाँ प्रोग्राम आने लगे तो ये भी हिंदुस्तान की तरफ देखने के लिए एक अच्छा कारण था मैंने उस जमाने में पंडित नेहरू को और इंदिरा जी को सड़कों में बच्चे के हैसियत से रहकर 
ان کو استقبال کیا ہے پھر بعد میں جب شاستری جی آئے تاشقند میں تاشقند کانفرنس کے لیے تو اس وقت ہم اب گریجویٹ ہو چکے تھے اور ہم انڈین ڈیلیگیشن سے ہم نے کام کیا ہے اس کے ساتھ انٹرپیٹیشن میں اور وغیرہ وغیرہ میں اس کی مدد کی ہے تاشقند is perhaps one of the most memorable places in the contemporary history of India. It rose to fame in India in 1966 when the Indian Prime Minister Lal Bahadur Shastri and Ayub Khan of Pakistan signed the famous Tashkent Accord. And it was here that the great leader of India breathed his last. The procession moved many a heart in the streets of Tashkent. There was hardly an eye without tears. Uzbekistan today has a street named after the former prime minister as a testimony of the people's respect for him. And there's not just a street, there's also a school where hundreds of curious children take keen interest in India, its culture and the language. <laughs> लोगों के जितने विदेशी भाषाएं हैं जितने विदेशी भाषाएं हैं चाहे वो अंग्रेजी है जर्मनी है वो जापान के चीन के हैं मगर हमारे लिए और ख़ास तौर से मेरे लिए दुनिया की सबसे सुंदर सबसे मधुर भाषा ये हिंदी भाषा है इन फैक्ट इंडिया वॉज पैप्स वन ऑफ द फर्स्ट टू रियलाइज द इनविटेबल In 1991, two weeks before Uzbekistan got its freedom for the Soviet Union, India invited President Islam Karimov to be the guest of honor at the celebration ceremony of Indian independence. Standing at the Red Fort marked an important moment in the history of the relationship between the two countries. The Red Fort was built by Shah Jahan, the great great grandson of Babur. who was originally a native of Uzbekistan. History writes its own version of time, sometimes as a witness and others as a passive onlooker. Today it's transition time for the Uzbek people who will take this country to its logical destiny. To feel the spirit of this nation, one only needs to look at its gigantic forts and ramparts. that have stood tall throughout these centuries at times turbulent but always inspiring perhaps no city is so evocative of the memories of the silk route as samarkand in fact samarkand is to the silk route what the taj is to india Travelers today, like the ones before them, have been awestruck by its art and architecture. As the golden rays of the rising sun kiss the massive structures At the Registan Square, time stands still. Easily the most awesome sight of Central Asia, the three main structures stand unaware of the number of generations they have nurtured. This seat of learning was distinguished by some extremely illustrious teachers, like the great mathematician Ulugbek himself. One of the most striking motifs on the giant monument is the decoration of animal forms like the tiger and the deer. This is a rarity in the Islamic world which prohibits depiction of live forms. However, those were the times when intellectuals looked beyond any diktat to communicate their ideas.
Today, as the fascinated visitor enters through this portal of time, trinket sellers, musicians, artists surround you, transporting you to another world of timelessness. It's time to put up one's feet and enjoy some traditional Uzbek showmanship. The crafts of Samarkand, or rather of Uzbekistan, bear an uncanny resemblance to the crafts of India, particularly of Kashmir. While many put this similarity down to the exchange of ideas between travellers and traders, there's also a story lesser known to the world. Apparently, Zain ul Abadin, popularly known as Badshah, one of the greatest kings to have ruled Kashmir, spent more than seven years of his formative age in Samarkand. An exceptionally talented man, he learnt many a craft from Samarkand and brought this newly acquired knowledge to India. Embroidery, carpet weaving, carvings, paper mache, and not just these crafts, but also the motifs have merged across the geographical and political boundaries. This art and architectural marvel can be witnessed in many parts of India, perhaps one of the greatest legacies of the Mughal dynasty or even earlier Islamic influences. And almost all of this influence came from this part of Central Asia. Almost everything in Uzbekistan sings the praise of its emperor, Amir Timur. Samarkand, his mausoleum, has a quaint tranquility about it. He rests here at the mausoleum he himself built for his favourite grandson, who died at an early age. The eerie atmosphere inside the tomb houses not just the Khmer, but also his two sons and two grandsons, including the famous Uluk Bek. Beck was probably more famous as an astronomer than as a ruler. His legendary observatory at Samarkand lies in ruins. But he had inspired many, including Jai Singh's Jantamanta at Jaipur. But 
what is remarkable about this city from the past is its colourful bazaars. Noisy and vibrant, defying time. It looks as though nothing has changed here for more than a thousand years, as though time forgot this buzzing centre of life. The bazaar is surrounded, almost engulfed, by another interesting monument called Bibi Khanum Mosque. There are various legends associated with this spectacle. Some believe that when Amir Taimur returned from India, he decided to construct a mosque much grander, much more gigantic, more magnificent than any other mosque anywhere. He recruited the best of masons and architects from all over the place. But he was never impressed by the height or grandeur of this structure. Another legend has it that his Chinese wife, Biwi Khanam, decided to build this mosque while Amir Taimur was away in India, and thus the name. The world's largest rahel, where the Holy Quran is rested, is placed here in stone. Another interesting site in this historical city is Afrasiop, where frescoes dating back to the 7th century AD have been found. These scenes depict the local rulers in a more relaxed mood. These were the pre-Arab times and reflect on those pre-Islamic days. The concoction of different religions is clearly visible here, with impressions of Islam surpassing all others. The State Museum of Cultural History houses a kaleidoscopic display of Samarkand's heritage. Close to Samarkand, the mausoleum of Imam Bukhari is one of the holiest spots of Islam. This great Muslim scholar studied the words of the Prophet Muhammad. His hadith is widely regarded by many as second only to the Quran for Islamic law. Many newlywed couples come to this holy shrine to offer prayers, seeking the blessings of the Almighty. The route from Samarkand to Bukhara will always fascinate a traveller. For thousands of years, travellers from China and India have traversed this route in search of greater markets. Looking at the skyline of the city, it seems as though different centuries have bequeathed their own impressions. Today there's an air of tranquility over this holiest city of Central Asia, which has seen many a battle. Most of the centre is an architectural preserve. Madrasas, massive mosques and the vast decaying fort lie silently echoing their stories. A surprising replica of its Indian counterpart, the Charminar of Bukhara, once used to be a madrasa. Those teachers and students have gone, but this restored monument still raises questions about how two monuments could be so similar. Perhaps the designs also travelled with the traders. However, the most striking monument of Bukhara is the Kalon Minaret of the 12th century. When it was built, it was supposed to be the tallest structure in Central Asia. At 47 meters, its architectural wonder has survived the worst of earthquakes and ravages of the raiders. At its foot, the 16th century Kalon Mosque is big enough for more than 10,000 worshippers. Right opposite the mosque is the Mir-e-Arab Madrasa. 
It was Central Asia's only functioning madrasa in the Soviet times. The oldest structure of Bukhara, the Ark, is more like a town within a town. It's an open museum under the sky. The remains of what was once a prosperous place to live in. Although it's now in ruins, several enterprising craftsmen entice visitors with their craft, like anywhere else in the world. Another 10th century monument of Bukhara is an elegant structure called the Mausoleum of Ismail Samani. The delicately baked terracotta work gradually changes its personality as the shadows shift. Interestingly, though the monument dates from the early Islamic times, the building bears Zoroastrian symbols, such as circles set in squares, symbolizing eternity. Bukhara and the desert city of Khiva, both open museums, have been in the eye of many storms. <laughs> The shackles of the chains still echo in the ears of the visitors to the ancient city of Kiva. This was once the centre of the slave trade. The times have changed, many a hundred years have passed. But it's impossible to ignore the gruesome history of Kiva. What fascinates one at the city of Kiva is the kind of detail architects used to give to their creations. Kiva's architecture added turquoise and red to the vivid spectrum of Uzbek color. These monuments here, like the ones in India, leave an amazing impression of the genius of those times. Today, these roads of Kiva look clean. But only a little imagination is needed to take one back to those barbaric days of slaves, when these streets must have been crowded, bustling and busy. Interestingly, like India, the Islamic legacy called the Jama Masjid is here at Kiva too. Only, it's known as the Juma Masjid. Decorated by 218 finely carved pillars that supported the roof once, it forms a spectacular sight. One of the many madassas here, Mohammed Amin Khan Madassa, has now been turned into a hotel that beckons the tourists with all the colours of this region. Kiva, Samarkand and Bukhara are perhaps windows to the past. They have all the necessary ingredients for a bestseller. Heroes, wars, raiders, geniuses and the huge canvas of Uzbekistan. But that was yesterday. Today's Uzbekistan is different. Tashkent is perhaps the best icon of the Uzbek spirit, modern and progressive, and yet with its feet firmly planted on the ground. The Soviet era is over. The statue of Amir Taimur has replaced Karl Marx in the central square. 
Fast food restaurants are handing out burgers, while the choikanas are still crowded for their palau, shashlik kebabs and naan. Even the names of food are similar to those on the Indian menu. In a food cuisine, you have the same thing, korma, kebab, uh, yakhni, so much so that even khichdi, even the word, the, the food, samosa, which they call samsa, though it is normally uh, stuffed with pumpkin and not potatoes. Uh, palau, all these dishes are the common there. Even karam paratha, we had there. One of the great surprises uh, was to find that uh, our tulsi plant, which is held sacred, is also grown almost in all the houses in Uzbekistan and regarded as muqaddas, which brings about a certain commonality which one would never have thought before. If one looks at the elaborate marriage ceremony, one sees Uzbeks have adopted to the new world. While the groom and the bride wear western trousseau and exchange rings and promises, the couple later indulge in the traditional nikah too. Nights in Tashkent can be exciting. Broadway Street is like the Champs-Élysées of Paris or Park Street of Kolkata. People are almost always in a carnival mood here. Tashkent, the capital, is perhaps the biggest city in Central Asia. Easily the most modern of all Uzbek cities, Tashkent has a new look to it. It's more European than any of its Asian associates. And there's a reason for that. The city was completely rebuilt from rubble after the massive earthquake of 1966. The earthquake memorial monument still remembers in stone those thousands of Soviet men and women who helped rebuild the city. A clock carved in stone still reminds the people of the unearthly hour of the great tragedy. Uzbeks are good at remembering. The war memorial, designed to depict an old woman waiting for her sons to return from the war, touches the heart. Names of the unsung heroes of the Second World War, when Uzbekistan was still within the Soviet Union, are enshrined here. A generation has passed since, but their loved ones still come here, almost like a custom. But life has moved on in Tashkent since. While the buses and trams dot the expansive streets of this city, an extremely efficient and well-decorated metro system makes travelling quite easy. Apparently, Uzbekistan has not lost its flair for lavish designs, even while designing this underground network for travellers. Forts and ramparts of Uzbekistan and India have stood tall through the centuries. Their transition to cities of concrete and cement has also been parallel. From Tashkent to Delhi, from Samarkand to Mumbai, cities of both Uzbekistan and India continue to share a common destiny. Modern bazaars, discotheques, shopping centers, business centers dot the cityscapes in both countries today.
Travelling across this city, one is amazed at the influence of India on the citizens. Cinema has been one of the greatest ambassadors of Indian goodwill to this part of the country. While names like the legendary Raj Kapoor and Mitun Chakraborty are still popular with the urban as well as the rural populace, the newer generation has their own favourites. Shah Rukh Khan and Juhi Chawla are the clear winners. <laughs> Dubbing Indian movies and television series in Uzbek language is a good business to be in. There are so many favourites, with the Ramayan and the Mahabharat being runaway successes. Shri Ramcharak Manas, Hamda Shri Valmikini, Ramayana Asara Asasada Surat Kalingan. Begim, Burkuni Irm Blam Kainam Nukulbada Zoklashtru, Mino or Pachmagam Bularding. Even Radio Tashkent has been broadcasting in Hindi for many decades now. Most of these impressions of India and the fondness for the Hindustani language have been generated by the State Institute of Oriental Studies at Tashkent, which offers a course in Hindi and in Urdu. Наши студенты проходят свои языковые стажировки в индийских университетах. Университет Джавахалала Неру, в Делийском университете, в университете, в Джамиат Исламия, Джамиат Миллия Исламия, также в Бомбейском университетах. Кроме этого, еще в Ташкенте имеются три школы. Это 24-я школа с уклоном инди, специализированной индийскому языку, он носит имя Джавахарлала Неру. Эта школа была основана еще в 1957 году, а также есть еще 92-я школа, Ташкентская городская, и 44-я школа на Челанзаре. Вот там они изучают индийский язык прям со второго по 12 класс. The institute buzzes with students who have taken to Indian languages and literature quite fondly. जब हम भारत गए थे तो मैंने फैसला किया कि कि मैं अच्छी तरह भविष्य में अच्छी तरह हिंदी सीखती हूँ और भारत जाकर और भारत जाऊँगी जरूर तो अभी हम एम एम ए पढ़ रहे हैं हिंदी सीख रहे हैं उर्दू सीख रहे हैं भारत का इतिहास भूगोल साहित्य सीखते हैं उनको रविंद्रनाथ ठाकुर से लेके प्रेमचंद कृष्ण चंदर से लेके अभी आधुनिक जयेंद्र कुमार अगर हम लेंगे बहुत कुछ कहना मुमकिन है और अगर काव्य क्षेत्र को काव्य रचना को हम लेंगे तो जयशंकर प्रसाद से तो सुमिंद्रनंद पांत निराला जैसे हरिवंत राज बच्चन महादेवी वार्मा से जिनकर जैसे बहुत बड़े कवि हैं और मोहम्मद इकबाल मर्जा गालब जैसे मशहूर कवियों के कविताओं को हमारे विद्यार्थी बहुत बड़े शौक से पढ़ते हैं और जानते भी हैं। Good education and a solid economy are the foundation stones of all prosperous societies. While the economy of Uzbekistan is still in the development stage, it is making rapid strides. Like India, Uzbekistan too is an agrarian society. Agriculture is and has been their most important source of income. 
However, in the Soviet days, Uzbekistan grew only cotton. Tons and tons of this white wealth were the backbone of this region. It still is one of the most important crops here. But since independence, Uzbekistan has had to make adjustments and make them quickly. They needed to produce their own wheat and maize and everything else they require. They've managed to make these changes really quite rapidly. This country is also endowed with rich reserves of metals and minerals. For instance, it's one of the largest producers of gold in Asia. Investment in heavy industries like automobiles is a sign of things to come. The markets may open up for investments, albeit a little cautiously. The industries involved in manufacturing Illusion aeroplanes are giving wings to the economy here. The country has good reserves of natural gas and is playing a major role in supplying this essential commodity to neighbouring countries. Margilan is the hub of the silk industry of Uzbekistan. It's believed that they learnt this craft of making silk from Chinese traders, who otherwise kept this a well-guarded secret. Though silk making originated in China, it came to India with the Uzbek traders. And of course, everybody loves good tourism. With the kind of history and cultural wealth Uzbekistan has, it has all the potential of tapping the tourist flow, which is now looking for new destinations. In the tourism industry, uh, big changes have uh, taken place. First of all, the, almost 95% of the tourist facilities have been privatized. Besides, some several uh, hotels were constructed and commissioned. Three uh, new hotels um, in Tashkent, Samarkand and Bukhara were constructed and commissioned by uh, Indian companies Tata Projects Ltd. and Larson and Tabro. And they are functioning. And I must say they are number one hotel facilities in Samarkand and Bukhara right now. Tashkent Circus has always provided wholesome family fun, packed with some daring feats. Perhaps the piece de resistance is the Alicia Navoy Opera, a majestic building harboring different regional artistic styles. It forms a perfect setting for a wonderful evening.
The first impression of a visit to Uzbekistan is that this country never ceases to surprise you. If the initial look of the country is that of desert landscapes with a lot of dusty roads and monuments, it's true, but not entirely. The eastern part of Uzbekistan, known as the Fargana Valley, is one of the most fertile patches of land in Central Asia. The mountains that surround Fergana are so far away that one wonders often why it's called a valley. But the beautiful landscape, rich soil and excellent climate make you put aside all questions. It's not surprising then that more than a third of Uzbekistan's population lives in this green part of the country, which is in stark contrast with the rest of the desert-like regions. The story of Fergana's fertile valley would never be complete without its enchanting orchards. Fergana's fruit has a widely travelled reputation, and legend has it that the Emperor Jahangir of India would spend a lot of effort and money just to get this fruit all the way to India for his palate. Andijan, which is Uzbekistan's main oil-producing region, has other claims to fame too. This town is the birthplace of Zahiruddin Baba, who inherited his father's kingdom before he was a teenager. He first ruled Kabul for more than two decades, before marching into Delhi in the 16th century. Though he ruled here for only four years, it was the beginning of a long saga, which we know today as the rule of the Mughal dynasty. Мы больше стали еще понимать и интересоваться Индией через великого Бабура, который родился в Узбекистане. И великий его Бабур Наме, который он написал так, он завершил в Индию. В основном и написал в Индию, и завершил в Индию. 25-26 годы он по просьбе вот отдельных представителей Индии так делает поход в сторону Индии. Значит, в районе Панипати они встречаются Ибрахим Луди, император Индии, и Захардин Мухаммад Бабур. Но их встреча завершается победой Захардина Мухаммада Бабура. Beside Baba, another great bridging legend between the two countries was Amir Khosro, a Sufi and a poet extraordinary. His ancestors too came from Sher e Sabz of Uzbekistan. One of the great uh, legendary figure in India, Indian cultural scene, is Amir Khosro. I mean, someone uh, who was equally at home in uh, the pomp and grandeur of uh, an imperial court right down to the village hamlet and the common people. So that uh, his uh, works, poetry, they are uh, a part of uh, the elite literature as well as of folk folklore. He was a great admirer of India. His ancestors were born in Shahr Sabz near Samarkand. Perhaps one of the greatest Indian poets of all time, Mirza Asadullah Khan Ghalib, also traces his roots back to Sheri Sabz. People of Uzbekistan are aware of this legacy and have commemorated this legendary poet by naming a street and a madrasa after Mirza Ghalib. G. 
geniuses travel as also their ideas. The Kutub Minar and the Kalan Minaret stand tall as witnesses to the exchanges between India and Uzbekistan. While the Janta Manta draws inspiration from Ulugbek's observatory, the people of India and Uzbekistan are rediscovering each other from their legacy. The history of Uzbekistan is what legends are made of. Marauding Mongols, invading Arabs, raiders and rulers, Khans and Amirs, and of course the Russians. There were also the traders, travelers, and the geniuses. Today, the lion-hearted people of this land stand poised to shape their destiny with their own vision. And the myriad images of their future are being painted right now.